The Southern California coast is a haven for drug treatment centers where kicking a habit can sound like a nice way to spend the vacation. But there's a much darker side to detox, insurance scams, malpractice, homelessness, even deaths. We'll examine all of this with a reporter who has been investigating Rehab Riviera. And we'll hear from a treatment center operator. Also here, a doctor who was reprimanded after a patient died from an acute drug intoxication. He's here to defend himself and tell us what's really going on in the world of drug addiction, right now on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Each new community Five Point brings to life represents a promise delivered. Great neighborhoods are more than just places to live, they are places to connect. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. All your life, people talk about what's best for you. But to most people, it's just that. Talk. Unless you're with Memorial Care, a healthcare system devoted to one important thing. What's best for you. Hi, I'm Rick Reef, and I'm here with three people to discuss a very important topic, and that's the issue of drug addiction, drug rehabilitation, and problems in our drug treatment system. And joining me are Terry Sforza, an investigative reporter for the Orange County Register. Also with us, Dr. Daniel Hedrick. He's an expert in addiction medicine. And also Omar Turby, who's operator of Hillside Laguna Treatment and Recovery Center in Laguna Beach. And thank you to all of you to be here. I would be remiss if not to note that you're all prominent in your own way. Uh, Tara, you've been on the show before. You're the, uh, uh, the OC watchdog at, at, the, at the register, mm -hmm. uh, and you've been working as one of the parts of the team on this series uh, on drug rehab, which we're about to get into. And Dr. Hedrick, I know you've spent a career in, in uh, the drug addiction field. And also, this is the, you said you have been on TV before, but it's been many, many years. Many years ago, you did commercials Frisbee as commercials. a kid throwing Frisbees because right. your father, Steady Ed Hedrick, was the inventor of the Frisbee. You did TV commercials. Yes. It's been a long time. You're on <laughs> not as pleasant a topic this time around, <laughs> but thank you so much for coming on. And, you. uh, and Omar, you, you, you've been on, you are, you are many things. You're a high-tech entrepreneur. You are also an expert in U.S.-Libya relations. That's not going very well right now either, but <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. And now you're in this business operating a uh, treatment center, and I know you all have interesting perspectives, and uh, so I look forward to hearing from all of you. So first of all, Terry, let's start with this series in the register, which I've been following. In fact, I've got all the clips. Here they are, <laughs> just so viewers can see the kind of work that, that uh, you at the register uh, and your, your uh, fellow reporters have been doing for months now and every aspect of this. I thought it was intriguing. The very lead off article was called Mainlining Money. So uh, explain that. What do you mean, Mainlining Money? Uh, basically, what we mean is that after the Affordable Care Act uh, came online and started covering addiction treatment in 2014, uh, the world changed, right? So everyone who needed treatment could get it. Now, California and Florida, you know, the, a lot of places, but primarily <laughs> in these two states, they have very low bars for entry to the business. You don't need any special expertise. Uh, California doesn't have any background checks. Um, so, you know, a, a criminal past wouldn't stop you from opening a state licensed and if you got that far certified treatment center. So um, a bunch of what I think you guys might agree are bad actors sort of rushed into the space because you could open up a center, um, you know, hire a counselor and offer treatment and you would be covered, you know, mandatory coverage um, by the um, the big insurers. And now, what's your inducement yeah. for doing this? Money, money, money. Okay, so that's that's the, the interesting part. So basically what was happening, I mean, a lot of the patients who have been um, flown here with, you know, full, full you know, you, that's the first illegal bit is that you cannot, you know, entice someone into treatment. But um, centers were providing airfare, picking people up at the airports and taking them um, 
to their centers. Now, a lot of these people were not insured, and they obtained insurance here. A lot of them would have been eligible for Medi-Cal because they're, you know, they were indigent or they were on the streets before. But, uh, and this was something that the um, State Department of Insurance was getting a little hip to. Um, they would be signing people up not for, you know, that basic Medicare stuff. They would be signing them up for private PPO insurance, which has a much better reimbursement rate for the treatment center than than Medi-Cal does. So they would. There was a guy who was reprimanded for lying about the income level of these people. Don't say that they're you know, getting $6,000 a year. They're making $27,000 a year, so they can afford this. And the treatment centers were, some of them still are, paying the insurance premiums for as long as they can bill that insurance company. And, and again, this is illegal in the State Department of, course, of Insurance. Is, I yeah. guess the bottom line is if people are getting treated, that's great, but they're not, right? Well, arguably, you know, there's, there's a whole question, which I'm sure we'll get into, about the, the way the way California, the social model versus a medical model of, of approaching addiction treatment. And, you know, apparently, you know, according to the federal government, SAMHSA and these, you know, the Society of, you know, Addiction Medicine, it, both of them, you know, are ideally working together, right? You'll have a medical management of, of especially with opioids, of the problem and treatment, you know, behavioral counseling to sort of pull all those right. pieces of your life together. Um, that's not largely what is happening in California. Um, this is a largely a social model, um, largely a six-bed situation. And what some of the operators are saying that, you know, we can't afford a big medical, um, you know, piece of this because we've got, we only have six beds here. We can't afford to, like, pay a doctor and pay a, an RN to be on, on site to, to care for these people. So there's um, perhaps a less than um, ideal uh, treatment being offered, and when often, or at least in some of the situations, uh, often is probably not the right word, but sometimes when people reach the end of their 28 days of coverage, if that's what their insurance was covering, um, they can start the whole cycle okay. again by testing dirty. Right. So the and I, I know that uh, Omar and the doctor are gonna want to weigh in on that and how, how they see this, but I thought one of the impressive things about this series, uh, Terry, was how, um, uh, how the register personalized this and really brought it in. We've just talked a lot about the regulations and all that and how it impacts people. And so let's look at this, a very dramatic photo. It's the one that led off the series. Uh, who is this, uh, who is this young man? That is uh, Timmy Solomon. He's from Boston and he came to California for treatment um, and has been cycling in and out and in and out and in and out for years. Um, he was really very brave because, you know, when we went out to try to find people, you know, we want to follow your journey, most people were like, yeah, no, thank you. But this gentleman, you know, wanted people to know what it was like and what was really going on out there. And he granted, uh, Lori Bashida and Mindy Shower spent months with him, you know, as he went through programs and being homeless and you know we're looking at more photos now of of him, of uh, him the yeah. lighting up uh it looks like a, being uh, detained by a police officer and uh sitting under a tree and and you know yeah that was after he was shooting up in a public uh public park um you know and he wanted he wants to get clean and i you know he was having a really hard time and one of the last um visits that we had with him before our series ran, I think it was in April. He um, was in a sober living house and he was, he got drug, he got some pills from the corner drugstore that some doctor called in for him and he went back to the sober living house and he crushed them up and he shot up oh. in the sober living house. What's this picture we're looking at here? This photograph is of, these gentlemen are uh, called interventionists and um, they, go around to various and sundry places. In this case, this was a, a, a supermarket parking lot um, down in uh, San Clemente. And they look for addicts who need treatment. And, you know, there's the, 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 they're doing a service, a lot of people would say, that they're, you know, finding these, these people who need help and getting them to places where they can be helped. Uh, other people say that uh, the interventionists are body brokers and that they are um, being paid by the treatment centers, and they're not taking them to the treatment center that would be best perhaps for this patient, but to the 
treatment center that's going to pay them the most. That's like, uh, you know, other people So they're have basically collecting a bounty. Exa uh, exactly, yes. <laughs> and, and, so they, yeah. and sometimes they will even front the insurance payment. I mean, they'll, they'll pay for the insurance premium to get these people, and then they collect when they get paid their commission, and then the centers will bilk the insurance companies, basically, right? Uh, that is pretty company. much how that little bit of the scam works, yes. Okay. We're looking at some other pictures here. Um, uh, you mentioned Timmy. These are other uh, gentlemen from out of state. All addicts, uh, all uh, came all for from treatment. All of them came, came for, treatment. for treatment and um, didn't, you know, make it uh, for very long. You know, sometimes when the insurance runs out, they are curbed. I think is the verb that's used. They're just sort of, you know, escorted and said, "Thank you very much. Good luck to you." Then, um, you know, other times they they're, you know, they're kicked out because they've been using. And you know, these programs don't want people in there, right? When they're when they're using, that's a very bad influence on the other on the other patients. Okay. And here's another picture. What are we looking at here? Uh, this is um, Alex Smick and his mother. Um, he was, he had actually been on his skateboard. He <coughs> was walking his dog and there was a dog altercation and the, he fell very hard off of his skateboard and uh, hurt his spine and got addicted to painkillers that way. And he had um, been in a couple of different um, facilities and he was, um, transferred down to Pacific Detox where Dr. Hedrick um, was, was working at, in South Laguna and he had been prescribed a, a lot of different drugs that according to the medical board's um, accusation you know, was basically a stew that um, contributed to his demise. And I know that you know, doc, th there's a, a lot to be said about whether the nursing care in the over, you know, it was overnight that he died and um, whether the nursing care was adequate and was checking him as he was supposed to be checked every, I believe, 30 minutes, and apparently that did not happen. And uh, the records show that he was administered medications after he was dead, um, and that he had slept through the night uh, after okay. he had died. So another mother who's lost her child yeah. and didn't, you know, was just trying to do the best that they could f for the child, but uh, this, you know, things didn't work out. Yeah. So Dr. Hedrick, that's kind of how you came up on the radar here as, right. as the doctor, and I know you have a much, uh, first of all, you want to defend yourself on this because you wound up getting reprimanded by yeah. the medical board. That's the, that's the bottom line. Um, tell us, uh, tell us uh, from your perspective what happened here and uh, you know, what, what do you want us to know about this? Well, I've been treating addiction medicine, uh, addicts and alcoholics, 17,000 uh, people I've detoxed, this is the one tragedy that happened like this has never happened before. It's the saddest thing that's ever happened to me. I think about it almost every day. I can't even imagine how the family feels about this. Um, if I was the family, I would probably react like them too. But to um, drag me in and paint me as somebody that's an over-prescribing doctor or associated with these crooked treatment centers, which I believe everything you said is true, but I'm not there. 32 years ago, I quit family practice to become an addiction specialist. I've detoxed more people than I think any doctor ha that I know has. I, I saw this epidemic happening t 32 years ago, and that's what I've been doing. I've never even written one prescription for an opiate for chronic pain. I've I used some opiates for a few days to get people off, medicine, uh, off opiates. But to say I'm over-prescribing is really not true. And I, and I spent a long time with the journalists that, that wrote that and included me in that article. And, and, and this tragedy happened in a hospital, acute care hospital, it has nothing to do with residential treatment centers. It was totally misplaced. So I'm here to defend myself. And the medical board now has made their final decision that it was more of a nursing issue. I didn't cause this death. And the nurse was reprimanded, right? Was fined, reprimanded, um, lost a, a large civil lawsuit, and was fired by me. I, I, my case was a public reprimand. It's the weakest form. It's, it's still bad. It's on my record. But there's no fine. There's no probation or suspension or classes or anything. I'm still working at all the hospitals. There was I've a malpractice suit. The mother filed a malpractice right, suit. Right. That was four what years ago. There? It was... I don't know what the term is, but it was tossed out. I was ready to defend myself and go to court and pick the jury and everything. We were ready for five weeks, 
and then it was canceled because the other side wanted to, to settle for a minimal amount, relatively minimal amount. And that was the problem. I really wish we had done that because then truth would have been out. Well, did you, you make know? that decision or who made the decision to settle? The lawyers, you know. But all the lawyers I mean, was it looked the at the insurance company or what? Uh, yeah, the insurance company pays them $20,000 or something, you know. And okay. um, I, right. because so they anyway. saw the facts and they said there's no case here, it's not worth it. And that was four years ago. But then there was allegations made, and they're just allegations. Allegation, by definition, is something that there's no hearing well, why or do you proof. Think, let me just ask you on this. Why did the medical board even prosecute the case against you then? Why well, didn't they, they just didn't, say no well, grounds here? And well, that's what they did. Well, there they was, set a reprimand. You got reprimand. Well, reprimand was for one count because uh, the nurse didn't do what I told her to do, him to do. And, and I didn't instruct, do the instructions close enough. This is a nurse I've worked with for years. Very basic. You check on the patient uh, one, uh, ha every half an hour, at least once an hour. It's just standard care. He really okay. dropped the ball. And, and it was when I wasn't there, it was in the middle of the night. Okay, so am I, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but if I hear what you're saying, you, 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 you have no quarrel with the overall approach of the register uh, investigation. You think they're doing, that this was valuable work they're right. doing, but you were the wrong example yeah. for them to use. Yeah, and I explained it to them. I think it's really deceiving and untrue. I, I think that they were more interested in making a story about me than telling the truth. And I told that to the journalist. My, my staff talked to him for an hour, explained okay. to him that this is a, a public reprimand. All this, you know, I've never prescribed an opiate for 32 years, and to put me under the same article is misplaced and deceiving and just trying to make a story instead okay. of telling the I truth. Don't know if you wanted to say anything on that, uh, Terry? Or um, I, I, the journalist you're talking about is a very, he's a very uh, good journalist. I think that it, we made clear that this was a was not a residential rehab and it was a a, a medical um, facility. Um, the uh, you know I, th I think the story was was was. Strong and it, the one of the examples that you know the, the the point I guess is that the mother you know was trying to get her son help and she it it, it yeah. didn't work out. Um, it is not a residential treatment. We we haven't just been writing about residential treatment centers, um, although we have been writing a lot about them. But you know it was, it's not a solely focused on residential treatment centers. We're trying to look at the the bigger picture. Uh, it, can I ask a question? Yeah. I know one of my questions is when these patients come in. Are they they're they're seen by you physically or I totally. mean yeah. they're they're all seen first by I spent hour and a half with him. Uh, we did in a matter of hours. We treated him like he was in an ICU, and he came from another hospital. Right. Transferred from a long distance because they knew that I did better than all these other hospitals. He had an EKG, chest X-ray, full labs, in a matter of hours. He saw me for an hour and a half. He saw nurses. You know, we couldn't have treated him any better except the nurse dropped the ball at night. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sort of, I'm going off in a little bit of a, of a tangent here though, but that, that screening, which, you know, is valuable, right? Is, you know, from a medical yeah. standpoint when we have people who are in compromised physical shape, right? Because they've been doing drugs. Uh, that's not done at all centers, right? I mean, right. And, and why? And, why is that? And should well, that be done? The, yeah, that's one of my recommendations. I have a list of six ideas that I've developed over the last 32 years to try to stop this epidemic and getting people getting mediocre, sloppy treatment. You know? it, and, and I think the residential treatment centers need to be up to the standard of more of a hospital level of care and treating this like a life-threatening, chronic, treatable but not curable illness. And, and getting a medical workup. And, and that's why now I'm, I'm running a residential treatment center and I'm there, I ev evaluate every single patient. I have 24 staff and it's a six bed facility. I'm there six or seven days a week. Nurses are there, they're, they're monitored. I'm trying to replicate what we've done in a hospital. A hospital a lot of times is too expensive. So I'm trying to get something that's more affordable and safe. But unfortunately, I would say 80% of the treatment centers out there, I wouldn't send anybody to them. Wow. They're mediocre. Even mediocre treatment is bad because too many people are dying from this. So, and they're just doing yeah. detox only. And they're not treating the mind and the body and the spirit. 
you have to look at the whole body. You mentioned you have five points, six points. Yeah. Uh, so, and I know when you, you said you wanted to come on, you were gonna, you, you were gonna give your side of the, uh, you know, yeah. of the death of, of Alex. Yeah. Um, uh, what are your suggestions? Me, you just yeah. said that you think most of the places, 80%, yeah. are mediocre or worse. Yeah. So what are your proposals for making this a better system? First of all, uh, Big Pharma could really help us out. They've um, created this, this, this um, misperception and deception of uh, the facts about use of opiates, chronic pain and opiates, it, it never panned out. It was, it was uh, a fraud and deceit and they, they actually were sued and they admitted to the fraud in 2006. They paid $600 million, but they made $2.6 million billion that year. So suing them doesn't work. But now we have this huge problem that, that's very unique in the world. I, I have friends that work in Europe and so they don't have this problem. Uh, United States is only 5% of the population. We consume 80% of all prescription opiates in the world. So they have this potential to maybe reverse this propaganda. Maybe they could use the same system but use it in a truthful way. Or maybe they should be focusing on medicines that help heal the brain, a detoxing brain. It, it takes 90 days for your brain to come back, and that's the good thing. You're not stuck with the same brain you have when you come into treatment. Okay. So for 90 days, you're technically under the influence of these drugs, and we're getting really good treatment to people that can't absorb the tools. So if we could have some you know, better medicines that would help heal the brain faster, right. so they could respond to treatment. And can uh, we go through the other points? Just give okay, me really two fun. more, because uh, uh, Omar has been sitting over here very patiently, <laughs> and we got to get him in on this, too. So uh, uh, how about two more? Yeah, medical schools need to train doctors on addiction and pain. They're not doing that. Um, there's, um, most good doctors actually don't understand addiction medicine. That's, that's a sad okay. thing. And I created a, a, a DVD to help train doctors about, think about what you're doing when you're okay. prescribing 120 Vicodin for a high school kid that sprained his wrist in football practice. Um, there's barcodes for prescriptions that they're starting to use in other states. So every controlled substance you write has a barcode, whether you take that and pay for it in cash or uh, through your insurance, okay. it goes into a big computer. You can track okay. these things really And I'll tell easy. you what, Doctor, we, uh, we have a, an open mic segment after this, and I'm encouraging viewers to go on YouTube and watch that. So we'll cover all of those others, but right now, Omar, you've been sitting there patiently, and uh, 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 Dr. Hedrick is actually your medical expert on staff, He's right? A, and you operate a place called Hillside Laguna, okay? and. When you talk about uh, high end, I've got the description here um, uh, of the, uh, you know, if you go to the website, it says, uh, first of all, beautiful panoramic. If somebody wants to see beautiful shots of the Laguna Coast, it's there on, on your website. Peaceful surroundings, private estate, luxurious experience, striving to be the finest treatment center. Also a little click on icon, check your insurance benefits now. So anyway, tell us, what are you trying to do and why did you get into this business? Well, first, thank you very much, Frick, for having me on. Um, delighted to be here. Uh, I run and manage a, a substance abuse treatment program at Laguna Beach and Laguna Hills. And um, I'm glad that I had the chance to listen to Dr. Dan and Terry. And investigative reporting is very important in this field. There's 129 kids that die every single day in the United States from opiate use. It's a national epidemic. And frankly, um, I get a great deal of satisfaction myself. And I think the time that I spent with Dr. Dan in the last three years or so, we have a lot in common in this. It makes you feel so good to take someone who's actually a dysfunctional human being who needs help. And at the end of the time that he leaves, you see them being more productive, yeah. healthier, looking better. There's no greater feeling than doing that, you know? Um, we do need more investigative reporters. Frankly, there's a couple of items in your presentation that need a little bit of brushing, a little bit of help. And I think you need to work on that. One, well, the, the medical work, the medical and the government and the free stuff doesn't treat anybody. 
if you have a medical license, a medical uh, 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 insurance policy, or cover California, any of that Omar, stuff. Omar, you have 20 seconds. Yeah. So, uh, is there anything else? I, I'm sorry that we we do in the open mic segment. We can go longer. No problem. But is there anything else? There, the insurance companies, the state of California, and that goes for national. Okay, and the treatment programs are all in three opposing tracks. They don't talk to each other well. Every one of them is performing okay. their work and uh, dealing okay. with this hall in a different way. And let's continue our discussion uh, in the open mic and maybe discuss a little more some possible solutions because all of you have, have, have studied this and you know, have some views. So that's it for now, and thanks again to my guests, Terry Sforza, Dr. Daniel Hedrick, and Omar Turby. You can watch this show and past shows at pbsocal.org or rickreef.com. You can also catch our shows and our post-show open mic talk on YouTube. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again on Inside OC. Inside OC is brought to you by Each new community Five Point brings to life represents a promise delivered. Great neighborhoods are more than just places to live. They are places to connect. Five Point is a proud sponsor of public television and community programming. Chapman University is a proud sponsor of Inside OC and community programming.